السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ویلکم بیک ناظرین آپ لوگوں سے جس طرح میں نے کہا تھا کہ ایف یو ہیو اینی کویشچن فار فیصل بھائی او یو وانٹ ٹو نو مور انفارمیشن اباؤٹ سرٹن تھنگس پلیز 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 ڈو ای میل ایس آن انفو ایٹ اکرا ڈاٹ ٹی وی میں پھر سے ریپیٹ کر دیتا ہوں انفو ایٹ اکرا ڈاٹ ٹی وی اینڈ ویو گوٹ آر ڈسٹنگوش گیسٹ ہے پہلے انٹروڈکشن آپ کا کروایا تھا ان سے ٹھیک ہے بون ان مریشس انڈین اوریجن Uh, most of his education in South Africa and the United Kingdom. He's a PhD, a scholar on Islamic Sharia and a lecturer. Uh, thank you so much, Faisal Bhai, for uh, joining us. Achha, before the break, we were talking about um, um, why are conventional mortgages haram? And you were... Yes, I, I explained something which many people don't appreciate. When mm-hmm. we are going to calculate how much we're going to pay, the, how do you break that amount? There are certain factors we got to take into account. One is the principal amount you borrowed. Number two, the interest that you have negotiated with. Then there's some cost associated with the house itself. And then there are some insurance you must give. Now, when you look at interest, because the definition of interest is, as I mentioned, the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, that is, you give money and it must be the same amount. If it is the same denomination, if anything above that will be riba. And the Quran says, وَحَلَّ وَحَرَّمَ riba. Now, I want to explain something here, if you give me permission. There's a confusion in the public between understanding the form and the substance of the transaction. When we take a mortgage, say for argument's sake, it's 200,000 and you are paying 3.7 or 2% or jobiho, you're paying your interest on that. That interest become haram. Now, when you go and you go search for Islamic version, you see the amount is the same or maybe more. Now, what is the problem? This is why this verse that I quoted is extremely important to understand the Sabah bin Nuzul, the reason this verse was revealed, and the Fuqaha, and some tafsir, I've explained that. When Rasulullah was in Medina, people came and said, hey, Muhammad, what is the difference between bay, that is transaction, and riba? Why you make riba haram? I just give you an example. No, no, but I, I, this is a very, uh, this is very, I because I, 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 I have the same question. This is a cup, for argument's sake, this Gigi. glass. You want it. I say, Kazi bhai, I'm selling it to you for 10 pounds. But my profit will be 2 pounds. In other words, I am making 20% profit with you. So you pay me 12 pounds. So I give it to you. You will pay me 12 pounds later. Now, you say, Fezabai, I need this glass, but I don't have money. I say, Kazibai, here's my 10 pounds. I'm not selling you. You pay me 12 pounds. What is the difference? This is a question that was asked. Is both the same glass? Is the same quantum of transaction, same amount of money? What is the difference? Absolutely. So Allah is categorically, he doesn't even explain the difference because it's logical. When I am buying this, I am selling it to you. When I buy it, I'm taking the risk in it. It breaks. What happens? I put an effort to go and buy it by the wholesaler and then sell it to you. These are economic actions that needs to be compensated. Even in conventional economics, we talk that. There is labor involved in that. Absolutely. There is money involved in that. There is risk I have taken into that. These are economic transactions. Yeah, absolutely. What if it doesn't sell? Yes. Whereas, if I give you the money, that's your problem. How you get the money to pay me back? I'm not taking any risk. You got to give it back. This why it rings in my ear, in my ear when William Shakespeare, the famous William Shakespeare, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you remember, if I'm not mistaken, one of his play, Merchant of Venice, if my memory serves me well, where the person borrowed money, and if he couldn't pay, he needed to give a part of his flesh, right? And without the blood, etc., etc. It gives you an idea in that time already how riba was something not to be appreciated. There are three problems in riba that people don't realize. Number one, You as an individual who claim riba, 
we are losing human utility. Say, for example, you are a doctor. Now you make enough money. Now you want to give money on loan and you want to sit and relax. What is happening? You as a doctor, people are using, losing your time, your expertise. That human utility is lost to society. Mm. And the person who claimed the riba, he developed greed, like I quoted you, William Shakespeare, who depicts that properly. That at an individual level, it creates a spiritual disease in a person. It makes you become lazy. He wants you to exploit others. Number two, at national level. At a national level, when this type of cancer is spread in society, you're getting money for no counter value. Say, for example, I want to sell this to you. Or, Ojobiho, I want to buy your car. I give you X amount of pounds. In exchange, I get the car. With Reba, what is happening? You're giving me money. What is the counter value? Time is passing by. Is passing of time an asset in Sharia? No. Unless it is associated with an asset. In this case, it is not associated with an asset. Time is passing by. There is no counter value. Indeed. The indeed. third point. So what you see at an international level, it creates, so at a national level, the rich and the poor, the gap is increasing more and more, as you know. Absolutely. At international level, it becomes uglier. Where we divide the first world and the second world, the poor countries and the rich countries, uh, people who got, uh, cannot sustain themselves, uh, no sustainable development, etc., etc., we start making those barriers and we develop that superiority complex, which again is a spiritual disease we're developing beside the economic disease. So this is why the Quran says, that is, bay is permissible where you enter into transactions. There is an economic investment in there. Whereas riba, time is passing by, you're just exploiting somebody. All right? I'm not talking about the banking sector. I'm talking about the concept now, the mm -hmm. concept of riba. Mm -hmm. Very important to understand. So you are, this time passing by, you're exploiting somebody. There is no counter value, right? The counter value is, it's an, what you call in economics, an opportunity cost. Say, for example, I give you 100,000 pounds. You need that money, and I tell you, okay, give me 10% interest. So you give me 10%. What is the argument I'm putting forward? I say, look, I have an opportunity cost. Should I take this money? I invested it somewhere else. I would have made money. So now you're taking that money, you are renting my money. Therefore, you, it's a rental for that. This is a flawed argument. Why? What proof you got? Should you have invested that money, you would that have made, you would have made something. Whereas Absolutely. here, you have hold somebody's neck, you have put a yoke on his neck, and he got to pay. Faisal Bhai, what is the solution? We'll come to that. This, this is why Islam this, is here. <laughs> That's why Islam is here. How beautiful is that? And Alhamdulillah, thank God for that. Thank Allah for that. So, tell me, I mean, what are the solutions for okay. this? Okay. Tell us the Islamic okay. solutions for this. One of the great Maliki scholars, Ibn Arabi, explained that difference in this verse. It's very, very deep in Islamic finance. Did you? That many people don't appreciate it. He says that for you to enter a transaction, what we call in Arabic an aqdul mu'awadha, that is a contract of exchange. A contract of, of exchange. exchange. Buying and selling, lease, etc. Absolutely. What happens there? For you to justify that profit, because the Quran says, وَحَلَّ bayah. Allah has make it halal. What justify that? There are three things that Ibn Arabi rahmullah mentions, and it's very, very deep. One is the hadith of Rasulullah al kharaj bi daman When I'm to sell you something, I got to take the responsibility in it. If something is wrong, I must give you back your money. Number two, al ghurb bil ghun. Any profit you make, if you want to claim something, no pain, no gain. The third one, is kasb. you got to put an effort in it al kasb that three legal maxims creates the islamic normative theory of profit because there is justice in it for example you go to a shop under english law i think they will give you 28 days to give it back to you that's right you want to. it's but just it is 28 it's, days, absolutely. And even if you, uh, um, some, it, it, 
in an English shop you, as a conventional thing, you can actually go out, take something and not pay any interest for a year as well. There are, there are, and that actually makes it halal as well, I yes. presume. So, you, can you see the economic rationale why profit is not exploitative? Because both parties are sharing the risk, both parties are compromising. The guy is saying, okay, I'm getting this glass for £12. Kazibai, you have put your time in it, you put your effort, you have taken a risk on that, just fair, I compensate you for that. Your time to stay in your shop, etc., etc. You are being paid for that. Whereas for Riba, I'm just sitting here crossing my fingers and I'm making money. And there is no counter value. Whether, whether the person loses it or doesn't lose it or whatever, he still at the end of the day yeah. owes you that money. Yes, so this there is, is a, no yes, risk this is a, attached. This to is it. where I, I think William Shakespeare depicts that properly, where he says, if you don't pay, you give me you this. You give me your flesh. Yes, it's so beautifully. And if you go back in Roman law, you become a slave if you don't pay your debt. Absolutely. In Roman law, Islam draws, Islam says, no way, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable because you are going to exploit others. There must be justice in society. There must, there yeah. must, absolutely. Acha, aap, sa, you know, te, you know, why, I, I mean, it, it, we know this, that Islamic mortgages are more expensive than conventional mortgages. Why are they more expensive? Okay. That is a very common question. Okay. The very first bank that came into existence was Milram Bank in 1963, which I would like to highlight. It was a German who sponsored it. Many people don't know about it. It, it was, was a in, German? Yes, in, in Egypt. And uh, it was for the farmers. Okay. Yeah. Then we got Tabong Haji in Malaysia, 1964. Okay. Which means what's called financial intermediation is quite new, the way we understand it in today's time. Whereas, if you look at banking, which started, if my memory serves me well, 463 in Florence, in Italy. This is why you call it bank. They would put uh, banco, uh, they call it banco, they put their, their money on the bench and they will make the deal. Yeah. This is where the word bank comes from, right? So, this is how it started, right? And uh, it's far, far, far more before. So you got a set of data, centuries of data, you built up your name, you built up your capital, so you are in a far, far better position to master that industry. And you have built up your capital, you have built up your goodwill, you have built up your name. Islamic finance started 1963. Okay, theoretically, books have been written in the past. Yeah. In the 1950s, for example, Ozey uh, But uh, operational-wise, it was in yes. 1963. And what really boosted it up was 1975. The first bank was, uh, commercial bank was Dubai Islamic Bank. So it's quite a nascent industry, which has not built up on economies of scale compared to the mega million. If you look at world trade per day, we're looking about maybe 50 trillion per day, the entire, maybe more, the entire Islamic finance, entire, including your sukuk market, your capital market, your insurance, your pension, etc. We're looking about 3 trillion. Just think about that. It's a drop in an ocean. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have to appreciate those dynamics that it is relatively young. It hasn't reached its economies of scale. However, there are some extra costs because of the idiosyncratic nature, the specific nature of Islamic banks and mortgages that builds up some extra cost on it. For example, your structuring, the, go, the bank has to buy it and then sell it to you yeah. instead of just giving you the money. Mm -hmm. uh, the bank will have a Sharia board, for example. Some Sharia board are relatively expensive. The bank will have uh, to have maybe other people to check it. The regulatory framework will be different. You've got to see a specific law firm. don't they have the same sort of thing in conventional mortgages as well? I mean, with the greatest reward, you have a, uh, an actuary who actually checks yeah, everything and, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, yeah, uh, but they have it, no problem. But they don't have a Sharia board, mm. whatever it is, 100, 200,000 pounds. And you've got a, a clientele base, which is about 60,000. For example, if you look with all due respect, look at Ryan Bank, its clientele base is quite small with a population of 3 million. It's about 60, 70,000 people, right? So relatively, it's quite, they haven't reached yeah, economies you know, of scale. In, in hindsight, I mean, you know, there are, you know, over a billion Muslims in this world. 1.6. 1.6 billion, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, and that's, you know, 
in in hindsight islamic mortgages would certainly should surpass the conventional mortgages in the, in that sense that you know there are so many muslims out there why are muslims not choosing that that way of okay the uh, reason for that is i had one of my student who is an alim who made a research on that uh, long ago for his master's degree there is a major problem of awareness yeah people don't now for them it's the same thing it's and, more and that's one of the reasons why you're here yeah. uh, so that is uh, one of the main problem now f with all due respect now if you want to to know about islamic mortgage you will go to your traditional ulama who in the syllabus in the curriculum because i went through the syllabus we don't study these things we no. try to study the classical books like al hidayah or al mughni ibn qudama this type of books were written long ago and we got the usul we try to adjust it in today's time unless you become ifta you do mufti that's at a higher level so now they haven't studied that you go to them you don't get a clear cut answer that and they're not men of finance as well i mean no, we don't blame them yeah. of course they are doing fantastic job they are doing fantastic oh, yes, job is solving problem of talaq zakat hajj. alhamdulillah but yeah. that specific area we don't blame them it's a, it demands takhassus it demands a specialization absolutely and uh, even people like sheikh taqwa usmani dama barakatuhum has been investing uh, decades in that not one year hmm. decades he has invested sheikh al qadari uh, there's so many great scholars outside there who have invested decades in that to start understanding what is happening if you allow me i explain a small point please please you see in the 1960s the world economy especially in the west started changing we had in the time of rasulullah what we call a real economy for example you want to buy a camel you take that camel in kazakhstan or you take it to china you take it to brazil a camel is a camel it got an intrinsic value hmm. with the financial economy developing we started developing financial instruments like bonds shares uh derivatives options futures policies etc these are piece of paper which got no value what got value what is written in it hmm. now what is written in it is based on law on regulation and many other things if it does not satisfy the rules and regulations it will be invalid therefore you got to make a legal construction of those documents hmm. that is not the job of every ulama to do that No, it isn't. It demands Indeed. a high level of expertise. Yeah, yeah right? absolutely. So we don't blame Oloma for that. Is something new? It just started in the 1960s, right? Okay, I know there will be futures in U.S. and so on, but the real momentum for the financial economy started in the 1960s. I got documents on that, and now it's a globalized world. Just to give you a taste of it, your derivative market is 20 times plus minus the world GDP. Wow! Just to give you what world we are living in. So when we look at this. it's very important to appreciate mm -hmm. how the world has changed so if people who got 1.6 billion 1.7 billion right now do they have the the means to buy it do you take a country like bangladesh for example what is the income of the average person what is the gdp of this country mm. right you take a country like india for example about 2 300 million what is the average income of the people right so you can keep on adding right the country which is really trying to make a a big leap in there is pakistan i've seen the last 5 6 years pakistan has really invested intellectually in that really? they are really yeah okay. pakistan is moving quite fast alhamdulillah uh, other countries i would mention malaysia okay so these countries there is awareness ulama are involved there is uh, the government is putting the shoulder to the cart Uh, so it's taking off but when the government is not covering it is not putting the shoulder to the cart there is no dynamism so this one of the reason why people don't appreciate it so when they want to inquire they don't have the right information therefore they don't want to offer it they go for something which is easy to understand readily available and therefore uh, the market doesn't expand so we have to talk about it from the mimbar from the seminars these type of programs people get educated and more people go you got the economies of scale the cost is brought down then you become competitive right
Wow. Okay, well, this is a very, very interesting, Thessal Bhai. Uh, Nazreen, uh, I'm sure that you will have a lot of questions for uh, Thessal Bhai. Ke liye. And uh, as you can see, ke he's giving you so much information. Uh, I hope that you will have questions jo hai, email karenge, and we'll certainly pass them on to Faisal Bhai. So the next time when we're together, uh, we'll try and answer those questions as well. Shukriya uh, bohat bohat aapka join karne ka. Faisal Bhai, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, especially in COVID ke zamane ke andar, <laughs> aapne himmat kari aur aapke hum bohat shukur guzar hain. Uh, Nazreen, agle hafte, uh, thik chhe baje, inshallah, uh, mein aapke paas hazir honga. Uh, Islamic Finance and Properties ke program leke or until then Allah Hafiz Allah Hafiz